Good afternoon. I kind of went to the wrong spot. So I'm just, though I've been on campus, I just got here. So I'm a little bit like, okay, I'm gonna like gather myself. Um, thank you. Um, I guess I'm gonna talk about my interests in photography and um, in particular that I collect photography, have an interest in it, have made, it, made images myself. Um, but the work that I'm going to discuss today is kind of images that I have found either online that are kind of discarded images of family uh, photo, sh photo booth images, or for that matter, um, photographs that I find online that, that are kind of these archives. And my relationship to archive is that it is this body that has uh, been put together that either is, tells as much as it does about, uh, or tells very little about its subject, but in fact may tell more about uh, the person who put the archive together, maybe more about the time that the archive was created. Um, so I'm always very skeptical and interested in looking at archives and how they function and what, they, what uh, aspect they serve or who do they serve and what do they kind of conceal. So it is always for me an open book. It is always something that I feel um, as an artist I can uh, intervene and I also take great pleasure just in the photographs as objects in and of themselves. Okay. So I'm going to kind of slide these because a lot of these works where I've used found photographs of these archives that I find are very intimate and small in scale. And this is a kind of an example of a photo booth piece where I, I collect all these different photo booth images which are no bigger than two by two inches, um, and then are framed in bronze um, with accompanying drawings or inks. But what's interesting to me about the photo booth is that they are the kind of real or the beginnings of a selfie. They are the beginnings of self-portraiture. And in that self-portraiture as a vehicle for the way that people kind of move through in the United States in terms of migration or through different countries in terms of documentation for work, um, they become these signifiers of aspiration, signifiers of how one is doing or how, wants to, how one wants to be perceived. And you are, as the sitter in the photo booth, you are in control of that image and also the kind of dissemination of that image. So these images over the years get um, discarded and then picked up again and then collected. And they become, for me, uh, the similarities in the way that people smile or in terms of couples who share the same frame, um, in terms of lovers or parent and child. There's kind of an array of singular images of individuals to kind of combined images of individuals that mark time. There's not much I know about these people that are in the photographs, in fact, other than maybe a note on the back or sometimes uh, with a name or that someone is cut out of a photograph given circumstances over the course of time. You want to save the image of yourself, but your companion in it no longer serves his or her or his purposes anymore. Um, so there are all these very interesting kind of details of that sort um, that occur in these images. So in my kind of, this takes a lot of like going to flea markets, going on eBay, kind of looking and buying and purchasing them. And in that effort over the course of time of these bodies of works of these um, photo booth images, I came across an image of a woman leaning up against a car, which I don't think I'm going to have here. And this is another example of a photo booth, which is really beautiful. And that's kind of out of a photo album um, that someone created called Love Occupator um, of this man kind of in different guises of dress and appearance. And there he is again. But in going through these images, I came across a picture of a woman um, leaning up against a car. And I thought, and it was very much like a snapshot uh, pinup image of a black woman. And the image said like uh, 1958 uh, Los Angeles, kind of really printed small on this kind of scalloped edge two and a quarter image. And I bought it. And in buying it, the seller said to me, oh, but I have 250 more images like this of this woman. Are you interested? So that is the author of an archive. 
I immediately said, sure, you know, tell me your price. I paid it. I get, what I get are three small, very beautiful, I'm get to her image, the images of that soon. Um, three small, really beautiful images. I mean, uh, photo albums with picture after picture of her posing on all these different kinds of circumstances. Very, uh, yeah, I can say as a photographer, kind of amateur photography shot with, of someone who has an aspiration of being a model, an actress um, in 1958 in Los Angeles who's black. So for me, that was amazing because I thought in 1958, uh, 1957, given uh, Jim Crow law, given that black actresses did not have an easy time in Hollywood, here was a black woman with the aspiration as an amateur to be on the stage, to be an actress or to be a model. And thus performing for the camera as an exercise in perfecting her game and perfecting her abilities as a subject, so to speak. So she creates all these different scenarios that she poses in. And I was quite shocked in getting this, all this material and like receiving this archive, which does not have family photographs, does not have any mention of name. It is purely like this portfolio of images for, for a particular um, ambition, for a particular use. It is separate from the kind of narrative of family history and time which makes her even more interesting because it is this archive of images that are solely and completely constructed. So then I look at these images for given the work that I do and my interest in photography by how much that photography belies our, in our uh, innate nature to ask it so many quick different questions about who's in the picture and very rarely are those questions answered. We kind of invent the questions ourselves as we gaze at the images. Here was a set of images where I knew nothing about her. And it really didn't, not that her identity didn't matter, but what mattered more was this activity, to kind of demonstrate this activity or to, for me as an artist, to somehow uh, represent it in, in a way. To kind of how would I, and now, and that was like 2009, and having all of these images um, pinned up on my wall in my studio, how might I share this as an artist? So given the kind of history of my own work and my relationship to photography and that I hate being in photographs and that I love directing and I love telling what people what to do and kind of being on the other side of the camera, I stood before all these photographs of her and thought I need to enlarge this activity. I need to reenact what she was doing in 1957. So much to my chagrin, that really didn't make me very happy because I was like, that's a fantastic idea, but I'm not really the kind of artist to do that. Um, so in taking up that, uh, what I thought was a good idea and following through with it, I was kind of miserable the entire time I sh shot that stuff. Um, only to the point because I don't feel comfortable in front of the camera, but also it became this very um, interesting way of mimicking uh, her or mimicking someone who has a completely different body type. I mean, I think she was taller and longer limbed than I, slightly double jointed, slightly longer torso. So she could do things with her body that when in trying to imitate her poses, for me, it felt like twister or some kind of yoga pose. I had the help of my daughter who kind of helped me, like she would look at the photograph, I was taking these images with a two and a quarter camera so everything was backwards and kind of had to direct me into position uh, in order to uh, approximate her poses by either clothing and attitude, etc. There's also in these kind of archive of images um, a photograph of a man who is playing chess. So she is the muse. She is the beauty who is photographed, who is sexual and enticing and smart and kind of defiant in front of the camera. And he is the artist, the intellectual. I mean, there's even a couple of shots of him with uh, art and kind of smoking a pipe or playing guitar. So, you know, it definitely has this, um, in terms of gender roles, her role is muse, his is artist in a kind of very conventional sense. It doesn't quite, I mean, there are only a couple of photographs that exist of them together in a frame where it seems as though it tries to uh, suggest that they are a couple. But again, all of this is constructed for the camera. All of this is about pre presenting them as figures 
in some other project later, that they are tangible, real figures and real icons that could perform in projects or in photographic um, ads later, right? So that also fascinated me, this kind of way of demonstrating and creating not so much a farce, but creating a constructed arena in and around these gender roles. So I also imitate him as well. Which, uh, but in doing so, which was interesting because I had um, friends of mine, you know, so I approached this archive in terms of uh, reenacting it with as much precision as I could in terms of finding the right outfits and finding the same lighting and having the chessboard look the same and kind of creating the same kind of poor lighting um, that appears in the original images, but also having a friend of mine that uh, named Idris Nichols who does hair uh, for film and is a hairstylist and another person did makeup to transform me into the male character. And in doing so, it was as part of the project, which was kind of interesting, I looked identical to my father. I mean, this is the way my father looked in a way. I mean, the hair, not so much, but... And in doing so, as we, you know, like when you're getting work done like that, which just takes a couple of hours to kind of do the, must, the fake mustache and, and all of this stuff, um, I looked in the mirror and I was shocked that I saw my father. So it became this kind of double or triple kind of mirroring of my father also in my work because I favor my father so much more than I do my mother. So that's me imitating him. So this project, there's like 300 some odd images and it kind of took, which was funny in the, its timing as I kind of got out of the, the um, schedule of other work that I was working on and got into the subject, into this um, project, it was the summer of 2009. So there's a lot of mirroring that is going on for me in terms of this piece. And as I work on it, I become more interested in this kind of idea of mirroring her. Uh, in a way, and that in some ways when the viewer looks at this work kind of in its, in its totality, which is a kind of over 300 some odd images, you, I get lost in it. It's like I, I kind of become her. It's only by looking at it for a while that you realize, oh, there's someone in here that's kind of imitating uh, what's going on to expand uh, the project, but also to exp expand its breadth and to kind of call attention to the to the art of performing for the camera. And this is kind of its installation. So, in part of that, you know, in my this is kind of part of my collection of photography. And um, in thinking about mirroring and thinking about this particular piece, um, uh, I would say, I then said, well, there's got to be something else I can do with that. Although it was really painful and not making all work should be like, great, oh, this is so much fun. It was fantastic working on stuff. I mean, sometimes working on work can either bring you to tears or can be really difficult or kind of cathartic. And this work certainly um, started out very difficult, with much difficulty in terms of my comfort level. But I started to think about, um, since I am not an actress and in some ways do not perform for the camera, I mean, part of it has to do with my lack of skill and um, understanding of that art. I then thought, okay, I'm gonna take it to another level. So I started talking to curators and different people, like, well, you know, because as most artists, when you're working, people always ask you as soon as you finish a show, you know, big show, working on a book, all this stuff, the next question, the same evening is, so what are you working on now? <laughs> You know, like, you don't get any time off. You don't get no downtime. Like, I don't know, I just finished some shit, I don't know. I mean, I'm figuring it out. You don't get to say that, you know, outside of, you know, very intimate company. And I, in those conversations, every time I said, like, it's about mirroring. Like, I want to do this thing where, you know, I'm mirrored and I kind of use these mirrored panels to have these two people playing chess, which is the most boring aspect coming out of this archive, to use an element out of the archive of those two individuals who are sh shot separately playing chess against themselves. So I want to, like, take the mirroring thing, which is the game of chess and perfecting one's game and kind of... Um, mirroring your own game by playing against yourself, I want to take it like to this kind of visual level. And every time I kind of bring that up, someone says to me, 
Yeah, but what about uh, Duchamp in that kind of five-way portrait that was taken of him in New York? Um, and I just, because it was Duchamp, and I know the image, and I was just so tired of hearing, I was like, yeah, I know, but I'm not, I'm not interested in that. And then finally, um, another curator whose name I right now cannot remember, um, but she had just been to a show at the Museum of Modern Art where an artist had taken a uh, work from the collection as part of her exhibition. It was kind of a myriad of different things out of their collection and things that she had personally, again, reaching out to archives, the archive of the museum in terms of its collection and also her pairing that collection with her own personal items. And she gets on her phone and she shows me this image, which is the same by the same unknown photographer, but now it's a black man with a straw hat. And I just felt like, okay, the universe is saying, I understand, you don't want to go with the Duchamp thing or the Picabia thing, which both of them had been photographed at that time. But this, I was like, okay, I give up. I will, I will use the five-way mirror like Duchamp, Picabia, and this unknown black man shot by the unknown photographer in like maybe 1910. So that led to this work called Chess. And as you can see, I'm like being made up here, but it's a kind of, it goes back to this image of the kind of trick photography of the turn of the century, which is, this is a kind of prime example of. Um, but that the five-way portrait is also that. It's just a 45 degree, two mirrors at 45 degrees, the subject sits in front of it, and you get this amazing and beautiful uncanny kind of relationship of the reflections that they are not symmetrical. They are not the Hitchcock go into a million versions of the same thing. They are all these kind of really individual angles that occur when you do that. So that therefore it looks like five identical five-way portraits, but that it's a little bit, um, you, there's a dislocation in looking at it because of, of its lack of symmetry uh, in terms of the reflections. So I do that and I come up with chess. So all that to say is, um, and I guess I'll show a clip from that, but I think in terms of my relationship, you know, with working with archives, working with, you know, uh, in terms of collages from Ebony Magazine or Jet Magazine or um, AP photographs and all of these, like going from the 1930s up into the 1980s, that in terms of rethinking the use of these things, or even in a kind of very personal, idiosyncratic way, kind of really frees up uh, in terms myself up in terms of ideas, but also that there is always at our fingertips a wealth of imagery, a wealth of either even personal photographs or things that you might just find on the street or ID cards of things to work with that in some ways ask for us in some ways to hold and take care of or to use. I really, um, the thing of uh, exact identification or kind of archives that are so protected, it kind of br brings to mind um, uh, Carl Van Vechten's uh, archive of images, which he, a lot of his images were part of the WPA and kind of part of the Library of Congress um, during the time of his life. But there was a, a bespoke set of homoerotic work that he did that he would not release until 25 years after his death and kind of are housed at, um, at Yale University. I think maybe about 10 or 15 years ago, those images were released. But it kind of shows m more about the mores of the time and thinking that everyone who ever ever had any connection to any of the people in those images would need to be dead in order for him to think about even releasing that archive. So the archive, and not so much, you know, I, of the eroticism in like looking at those images, I mean, particularly to me, there's nothing uh, particularly fascinating about them, but it's more the effort of how that is a hidden archive that is like a time capsule and the efforts to make it so speak more about the time and the milieu that he was a part of. So for me, the archive is always this interesting thing that pushes and pulls at itself, that in its presentation and in its um, idea that it is uh, op an open book of information, it actually belies some information. Um, I've gone through archives myself in terms of family histories. I, my family background is let's see, Chicago, New Orleans, and Jamaica, and Cuba. So I really heavily rely on the Mormons who want to save everybody's soul and that they have, you know, visual documentation of every single birth record almost over, for over most of the planet, 
particularly the Caribbean, but most of the planet in the United States, and, and in Latin America as well. But that even those archives in trying to match up birth certificates to narratives of family history don't always match up and in some ways um, are contradictory within themselves. So the idea of the archive and how much we can rely on them is in as much as that we uh, know that there are gaps and fissures and um, concealment all embedded in what seems to be a very open and present, uh, wholly presented uh, document or documents. Yeah. Um, okay, You're that's ready. it. We're ready to go. Thank yeah. you. So chess became this piece um, in all this mirroring, but I also then asked a friend of mine, Jason Moran, to create a score, and I also asked him to perform in it. So in where you saw that set of me in front of the mirror, I play the man playing chess, and then I play the woman playing chess, and at the same time, those characters playing against themselves um, age. They get older over the course of the uh, uh, time, time frame of the video. Um, I also, photographed Jason kind of creating this amazing um, piece that he says, because uh, I asked if he would create a piece in terms of the mirroring of hands, in terms of the piano. He is a pianist and composer. And w that was interesting to me because there is this kind of exercise thing in terms of uh, playing the piano that you play uh, the chords and the way that you play mirrors one of them. I guess it's Bach who also um, heavily relies as exercises to train the hands in that manner. So he came up with this amazing score that he also performed, that um, he was photographed and recorded while playing it. kind of a compilation because of the nature of the way that the installation is made. You can't really, I can't really, it's a, it's a three channel work. So this is a kind of flow through the space of the installation. kind of a clip of, um, of chess. And so I guess my fascination with archive also extends to film because I've also done um, a piece called The Institute, which um, for a period of time is collecting um, unassembled raw footage um, from different institutions, like either black um, 
educational films, and one was from an institution for speech pathology that had never been put together and kind of played with that as well. And there is something, you know, at its heart, and that's why I always, um, I think from the beginning of my career and in kind of terms of graduate school, being really interested in this idea of documentary, that documentary does exist, but it, it kind of is within the hands of the person who is crafting it. Um, and speaks so high, so much about that is integrated into that object. Um, that there's always a way to revise. There's always to, a way to take another look, to look for the things that are missing, to look for the things um, that were purposely left out. I find to be really interesting. That's it. Thank you.